Good morning. Thank you for the uh, introduction, uh, René. Um, I'm going to kick things off with uh, an, a broad uh, general presentation uh, with uh, a focus on the challenges that we face, uh, specifically climate challenge and, and what it means for uh, your industry going forward, but for the industry at large, and also about here and there touch on the digital transformation that we are experiencing because these two uh, come together at a very interesting moment uh, and I believe they will create uh, a lot of challenges for those organizations who don't adapt quickly uh, but even greater uh, opportunities for those who, uh, who seize the moment and want to shape the next industrial revolution because that's what we really living today. We are living the end of one era and things are kicking off in terms of energy and the way we, uh, we deal with uh, digital transformation. So I'm going to try to combine both. The focus is um, uh, climate change as a, as a challenge. I'll start with a couple of minutes talking about that and then I'll uh, look at four possible benefits, four possible returns uh, for, for companies, for, for companies like yours, uh, for engaging in this energy transition and touch upon how um, the digital revolution actually helps us move to this fossil-free future. Okay, uh, let's see if this works. The battery is... Yes. Um, this is a slide, it's, a, it's the third time I do this presentation. Every time I do, I do the presentation, I just use the updated slide of this. Uh, you may have heard um, of the World Economic Forum. This it's is a slide, it's, who, a, it's the third time I do this presentation. Davos, every time I do, um, I do the presentation, every, uh, I just uh, use the updated slide of this. Uh, you may have heard of um, the World Economic Forum. This is a slide, it's, who, uh, it's the third time I do this presentation. Davos, every time I do, um, I do the presentation, every, uh, I just use the updated slide of this. You may have heard of the World Economic Forum. This is a slide, it's, who, uh, a, it's the third time I do this. You really want to hear me several times and I will. We're good? Okay. Great. <laughs> Stephanie is laughing. Don't laugh, Stephanie. Um, and what it says is that, you know, for 15 years or so, or 12 years, they've published this report in January when they have the, the annual meeting in Davos, all the political and economic leaders of the world gather, and they publish a report at the same time looking at the risks that we're facing. And there's a number of risks, you know, uh, risk within the 10, 10 coming years that, that may have the biggest impact on the world economy. So it's not... WWF, it's not Greenpeace or so publishing this. What's interesting is when you look at the risks, many of them are known, uh, asset bubbles in the economy, terrorist attacks, uh, uh, interstate conflicts, blah, blah, blah. But without fail, every single year in the last six or seven years, uh, those risks that have the largest impact on the economy and the highest probability of appearing, that's the horizontal axis, are related to climate change. Uh, failure to adapt, failure also to take on the cause, mitigate uh, climate change. And uh, it's really interesting to see that this comes from the world's top uh, economics, economic thinkers and, and uh, leaders. And, and it's not really a surprise because when you look at this change, it's really happening in front of our eyes. It's not some theoretical prospect for the future, for in 30 or 40 years, we just, we measure it, we see it happening. And the, f the things we see happening are actually have a delay of 30 or 40 years. When we talk about climate change, uh, it's interesting to have a, of global warming, an idea about how warch, warming there really is. And, and it's an absurd figure, but when you, when you were to, to put a figure on it about how much more heat we retain, around the, the planet, that's, that's the, the figure. It's the equivalent of an atomic bomb 400 times every day, all day long, uh, uh, all year long. That's the surplus of heat that we accumulate. And we see, we see it happening uh, quite uh, 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 clearly in, in front of our eyes that the average that we have known in the last uh, 100 years, the 20th century average, we slightly and slowly but surely climb uh, above that. 
and most of the warming that goes uh, uh, that happens in, in, in our uh, climate is actually not visible even. Most of it is captured in, in the oceans. You see it here, it's the same as this animation, but we go faster and faster and faster. And you may have heard that our goals are to stay below one and a half degrees by the end of the century. We're already, uh, you know, uh, moving ahead towards that target very uh, quickly. And so this heat is mostly <coughs> captured in the oceans. Uh, uh, it's, it's like a, a thermal reservoir. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, like a, uh, a bouillot, like they say in, in Dutch, to, to heat your, uh, your bed when you're cold. You, it's an excellent way to, to store energy. And so what we're actually measuring in the atmosphere is literally only the tip of the iceberg. And I'm going to briefly touch upon a, a couple of, of uh, effects. You know them probably. But one of them, for instance, is with, with those warmer waters, there's more evaporation. So storm systems that exist will be fed with more energy and with more mass. So a normal, between brackets, storm system becomes a storm system uh, of class five, which creates incredible damages like we've seen all around the world. This is from the Philippines from a couple of years ago. Uh, this evaporation also leads to storms on land that just carry more uh, water with them. And I don't know if you remember uh, Florence, Hurricane Florence, at the end of last year on the east coast of the United States. Significant inundation, water rises above nine feet nearby, and even farther west than that, this storm surge will find its way well inland. So let's now have a look at what that might be like. For example, we know Florence is going to bring one to three feet of inundation across many locations. That certainly is enough to knock you off your feet. It can definitely stall cars out and even carry cars away and certainly flood many of the lower levels of structures. But we know Florence is also going to bring water rises well above that, perhaps up to six feet. Now, six feet of water, imagine that. That carries large objects in it, like cars, for example, that can act like battering rams and enhance the damage that would otherwise be. And also, we know that can flood the lower levels of many structures. We also know that Florence is going to carry with it likely storm surge well above that. Perhaps 9, 10 feet, maybe more. That will totally cover up one-story buildings and structures, leaving them underwater and certainly pose a risk to many. There are very few places that are safe when the water rises this high. So please, follow the advice of your local officials and heed the evacuation warnings and of course stay updated on all the latest forecasts. happens uh, well inland because the storm surge carried with more rain and slightly uh, higher sea levels can all combine and create conditions in which far inland this kind of uh, effect can happen. Over the world in, in general, uh, the sea level rise is also happening. It's, it's happening slowly but surely. This is where it originates, really. Uh, when you look at Greenland and, and uh, uh, the South Pole, the melting ice that's happening there leads to rivers of melting uh, water that then go to vertical uh, ducts that they call moulins. It's like a, a vertical river of, of a couple of thousand meters sometimes, which then leads to the rock and creates sea level uh, rise around the world. And the communities that are hit first and hit hardest are obviously the the poorest communities uh, uh, in developing countries who are trying to uh, uh, cope and build uh, uh, or improvise seawalls, uh, like you see here in, in these pictures. Um, ironically, sometimes they use the oil drums as a, as a mold to, to create those walls. Uh, it's happening, it's accelerating also. Uh, in the beginning of last century, it took 40 years for a sea rise uh, of 50 millimeter, now it takes 13 years. So the sea level rise is happening. It's threatening many uh, areas around the world. Most, some of the, the most uh, high value uh, areas in the world, uh, you know, half of the world's uh, uh, major cities are on the coast. Uh, so this is uh, quite an impact that we can uh, uh, expect. 
And this is a simulation from um, BBC or New York Times from a couple of years ago, saying if we look at, at a, a, a metropole like uh, uh, Shanghai and we look even at a sea level rise of uh, uh, combined with two degrees, let's see if it works, this is what it would lead to if we go to two degrees, which is already an optimistic uh, scenario. And if we go further, uh, it's much, much worse. I can spend the whole day talking about this, but that's not the point. This, in summary, is what we're facing, three major things. So we will lose all coastal cities. That's quite clear. If, if we continue on this track, it's not, it's going to be annoying or so. We will lose all coastal cities. That's almost a given if it continues on this track. Second, which is maybe even more important, because we might have time to adapt to this, is that our life support systems are imploding. We are destroying natural capital, uh, coral reefs, pollination systems, uh, freshwater systems are just collapsing uh, 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 wh while we're looking at it. And then third, there's going to be an extreme move pressure for people to move to other areas because the tropics and subtropics will become uninhabitable. And so the conditions that created the Sahara Desert, for instance, are already moving towards Mediterranean and above. And these are uh, images uh, from 2017 and 2018, very, very close to home. So conditions we only saw in much more uh, tropical regions are moving. That's, that's the change we're facing. It's happening. We can still flip it, but we have a very short window of opportunity. And the annoying thing is, annoying is a soft word, is that there's a 30 to 40 year delay between emitting one ton of CO2 and seeing these kinds of effects. So in other words, these effects are probably all initiated before you guys were born. It's the result of CO2 emissions up until the 1980s, and that's the result, uh, um, the cause of the, the symptoms that we see now. Okay, I think you get the idea there. Um, the real worry is that there would be tipping points. Eh? That's why there's such a window of opportunity that, that we would put in motion things that start to reinforce themselves and that we would lose the possibility to intervene and move off of uh, fossil fuels. And that's why in, um, in 2015, the whole world came together and uh, decided on, uh, you know, agreeing on science-based targets to move off of fossil fuels and into uh, a more sustainable uh, era. It's, it's really not to be underestimated how important this is, because it's not enough, but it's almost like the, the universal rights, uh, uh, human rights, uh, in which all countries, even the United States still, they still have a year to go bef before they can formally uh, quit, agreed on setting those uh, targets. And those targets are actually uh, really science-based. They're, uh, they're achievable uh, economically and technically, but the problem is that there's an inconsistency between the targets and the plans that all the countries who signed this uh, uh, agreement uh, put forward. So the targets are the, the green line, and we want to stay below one and a half degrees uh, by the end of the century. And when you look at the, the wide orange, I don't know if this works still, the wide orange um, line, this is the sum of all the plans uh, of the countries who signed it. So there's a big gap there between intention and the real uh, uh, action. So this leads to um, what I call uh, an incredible opportunity. We're facing this situation. On the one hand, it sucks. We are the generation, you are the generation that has to deal with this. But on the other hand, it's an incredible opportunity because if we seize this moment, we can really shape the generations that come after us. And all the solutions are there. All the, the things we have, we, we need to, to, to create this uh, industrial revolution are there. It's just for us to seize them and see them as a business opportunity. And that's what I want to talk about um, in the next uh, couple of minutes. Um, 
let's dive right in. This is an interesting slide. I think it's from uh, McKinsey. Yeah, that that shows that uh, you know, in order to meet uh, the the change, the challenges that we we face, we'll need to improve our productivities on several aspects: the, the way we use materials, the way we uh, grow our food, the way we uh, generate electricity, the way we 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 run our economy in terms of uh, economic growth and 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 how much carbon is produced, all of these things will need an incredible uh, uh, productivity uh, increase. So it's a real driver to improve the, the productivity uh, of, of our economy. But as I said, we, we have a window of opportunity. We have a physical law to respect. That's called the carbon budget. It's the surface area under, under this uh, line. And the line you can easily remember it's essentially every 10 years we have to reduce our CO2 emissions by 50%. That's, that's if you want to uh, remember it uh, uh, easily, that's uh, the, what it boils down to. It's possible to do. Oops, sorry. It's possible to do. Uh, it's going to be a challenge, but it's going to be an incredible uh, opportunity. I'll send those slides around, but there's one thing that you owe yourself to look at. It's a new study that came out uh, in April uh, of this year, so um, two months ago, published by uh, a Finnish university. It's the work of four and a half years of R&D by 18 scientists. And they just looked at the questions based on what we now know in terms of cost and technology, etc. Is it possible? to completely move off fossil fuels, and how much will it cost, and how will we do that? That's the question, the research question, for all the, the energy sectors that we need. Power, heat, transportation, and desalination, which will become uh, a big one. And I only have four slides of, of this uh, 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 report, but it's really worthwhile of reading the executive summary. Uh, the first shows that there's going to be a, an incredible fuel shift. We all know it, but it's interesting to, to see it really fleshed out. In the sense that what we all, the energy mix that we now use, which is mainly fossil fuel based, will over the decades completely shift to um, an electricity based uh, uh, system. And as we do this fuel shift, as we move from fossil fuels to electricity as a carrier for energy, not only will we uh, eliminate all regional dependencies, because we'll, we won't be uh, dependent anymore from uh, dodgy geopolitical regions to uh, uh, you know, import our energy, will be self-supply for a big part, but also will create an incredible um, energy efficiency improvement um, that you see there, the, the dotted line would be uh, the amount of energy we need uh, if we were still reliant on fossil fuels, this is what happens when we shift to uh, electricity. So it's not just a fuel shift, it's an, an uh, um, energy efficiency improvement. Obviously, and that's probably not a surprise, the big sources of energy will be wind and solar, with solar uh, taking the largest uh, cut. And what's really interesting is when you look at the levelized cost of energy, uh, that we actually, with the, the prices that we have now and the technology that we have now, so it's not something that still has to be invented or improved, we still end up with a system that's slightly cheaper than what we have now. The fuel costs disappear, you see, it's mostly uh, capex costs instead of having operational costs, buying fuel to run your energy system, it becomes an investment, capex, and those capex will be used to build all kinds of things, from offshore wind uh, uh, parks to uh, solar arrays to smart grids to biogas storage to uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, new uh, developments in heating and, and desalination and, and storage, uh, neighborhood uh, batteries, uh, etc. And if, do, if we do this well, we are able to move off of fossil fuel within 
the carbon budget that I, uh, that I showed. Uh, it's, it's possible to stay under this curve and it creates, only in this sector, it creates uh, 15 million additional jobs. So there's a large part of jobs that will disappear here in the, the, the black, fossil fuel based uh, jobs. Uh, but this shift is happening and it's happening uh, right now. And so this leads me to the, the four uh, returns that I wanted to talk uh, about, um, which are, I'm gonna skip a couple of slides. If we do this well, we are going to uh, profit in a number of ways, and those are the four that I put forward uh, today. On the one hand, those two bottom ones improve our operations, reduce costs by working smarter, by mo working more digitally, uh, by, by looking at, at uh, you know, optimization and, and fuel shifts, uh, anticipating certain risks. What if there's going to be a carbon tax? What if we don't have access to some markets uh, anymore? Uh, what if changes happen faster than, than expected? So those are improving your operations, but then, and that's the most interesting, is starting to think a bit longer term. What new services and products will be needed? And how can we, as you know, young professionals, start to develop new products and services to meet those demands? And at the same time, help with this transition. And then at the end, and that's really the last element, is how can we um, actually improve our brand by talking about this uh, and, and you know, uh, inspiring our customers, our shareholders, maybe our, even our competitors to, uh, to do the same. So quickly, a couple of examples uh, here in different domains, some related to what you do, some outside of that. Um, this is a, a, a first uh, uh, example that I uh, used also uh, last year in which um, the automatic information uh, uh, identification systems are uh, enhanced with all kind of new sensor data, uh, co automatically collected data through the, the, the plethora of sensors that we'll have available through Internet of Things and, and new satellite imagery uh, and, and new communication channels that will actually improve the way you plan uh, uh, the logistics in the way we use the machinery to, uh, to provide the work, and in general, uh, uh, to better plan the, the work you do typically in your sector. And there's one uh, company that's a, a startup in, um, in, uh, in the west coast of the United States called Planet.com that starts to build a really interesting tool for this. It's called Planet. Dot com, it's almost a, a search engine for visual satellite data. They take one image of the whole planet every day and you can start to look for patterns and recognitions uh, there. I'm gonna run a small video. So the API is just an endpoint through which our customers can ask our servers, hey, do you have imagery here? What's some yeah. metadata behind that imagery? And I would like to download that image. Our imagery is really powerful because it allows us to uncover things like deforestation, agricultural... I'm gonna increase it here. Oh, it's the maximum. Sorry. So the API is just... So the API is just an endpoint through which our customers can ask our servers, hey, do you have imagery here? What's some metadata behind that imagery? And I would like to download that image. Our imagery is really powerful because it allows us to uncover things like deforestation, agricultural change, monitoring geopolitical developments, analyzing shipping activity in ports. Planet was founded to use space to help life on Earth. And we have the capability to image that, but now we can translate those images into a, a massive data set that actually allows us to tap into that daily variation in the Earth's surface to really see the planet change. And, and it's, um, it really looks like uh, an incredible, powerful inf interface. You can uh, identify the kind of uh, ships uh, 
uh, you know, distinguish between cargo, fishing, or navy vessels, for instance. You can look at uh, offshore uh, oil or, or, or renewables uh, settlements, etc. It's really like a visual uh, global uh, search engine for satellite uh, information coupled with uh, all kinds of big data uh, about the country or the region and allows you to really understand what's happening and, and plan better uh, for uh, contracts and, and the kind of work that happens. Um, and it's, it's used also to start to think about uh, how to run supply chains more and more. This, this artificial intelligence and big data influences the way uh, you know, the, the logistics systems are, are run uh, around the world. So it has a big impact on analyzing and see, seeing uh, what's happening, but it's also going to have a big impact on your operations uh, and how things are going to be controlled uh, and, and behaved. And one example I, I like to give there is uh, what's happening with uh, uh, auto, uh, autonomous driving. It's much closer than what we think. This is a, a, a stock Model 3, a Tesla Model 3, so it's not equipped with LiDAR, not equipped with any special uh, uh, hardware. This is just the standard Model 3 that runs off of the uh, conveyor belt, 7,000 units per week. They have eight cameras, they have a, a radar, and it's just, this is just an over-the-air software update that within the year will allow full autonomous driving plus sharing. So in this case, it has nothing to do with your business, but it's just to give you an idea of how fast these things evolve. A couple of years, we were looking at TED Talks, uh, explaining uh, about the Google car and things uh, that were coming. Now you have it in a $35,000 uh, middle-class car that's being sold by uh, thousands uh, every year. And what's coming out of this is really interesting. There's a four-hour talk about this autonomy system uh, in, in the Teslas. They have the, you know, the brightest minds working on this. And this, is, this kind of gives you the kind of problems that, that you're identifying with image systems. Because what is this? Is it a, a bike? Should I brake and, and, and be careful? You know, all these kind of conflicting situations uh, you see when you move to autonomous systems. And what they do, because 500,000 cars are equipped with this sensor suite, just like in the planet.com, they can query the network and ask for similar, similar images around the world and look at the situations in which this occurs and whether it's recognized correctly uh, or not. So you can do that and you can do it for all kinds of other things as well. You can start to query for uh, animals or for debris or, or, or etc. And so this is being fed into the machine learning system that will tag this. Some of them will, will be wrong and, and it happens and you know the the behavior of the car is not as expected. Then there's an inaccuracy, there's a, there's a problem, uh, you know, you still have to be uh, careful for the moment. This difference between what the image system thinks it is and the reality is being corrected, it improves. And over the year, this becomes better and better and better. And that's a thing, we'll get to it at the end of the talk, which we always underestimate because this takes the form of an exponential curve. It's a gimmick to begin, ha <laughs> ha, look at this car, how, how badly it behaves, and it improves, improves, and all of a sudden, it will be much, much better than human-based drivers. And no insurance in the world in 10 or 15 years will still want to insure human-based drivers who are tired or drunk or looking at their cell phones or worried about the kids in the back, and all of a sudden, these changes will, will be there and we will be surprised. And it happens also in your in industrial um, settings. This is a, an example in which uh, artificial intelligence uh, systems are being used to augment the experience and the inside of an operator of dredger uh, equipment. You know, they have to do this 12-hour in one shift, they have to exactly know how to control and how to plan 
and monitor the, the trailing section, uh, hopper dredger in this case. And, and when this is augmented, supplemented with good AI suggestion or control, and in which things that are hard to measure, like uh, the grain size of, of your pump materials, you cannot not always know, you know what kind of uh, stuff you're pumping. If this is estimated through an AI system that improves over time, you will see systems in which humans and machines actually perform much better at much lower cost. And maybe over time, those operators will also be uh, replaced by fully AI-based systems that are much cheaper to run, can run continuously, uh, not only in 12-hour shifts, but uh, do a much better job. Okay? This is... Um, Something else, but it's also the evolution we're seeing, also to reduce the... What's this? I'm really being tested today. We... Okay, let's not go there. Um, this is actually a, a, a news article that was recently published about uh, how uh, drones and autonomous systems will also take some of the cost of of maintaining offshore uh, installation and and actually uh, you know uh, look at uh, where maintenance is needed and and make do that in a much safer way and and much um, more proactive way. Um, planning the the dredge uh, routing is also really hard. There's uh, there's not a lot of uh, data available to uh, you know it's not uh, like like Google Maps. So you need really good uh, um, survey data and then positioning systems, etc. And we see that more and more AI uh, and and um, uh, machine learning systems are being applied to. Uh, propose uh, a route taking into account the currents and all of, of the efficiency and the kind of soil uh, or, or ground but, that you have, but it really hinges on the, the stability of the data network, because those are such large uh, amounts of data, and on uh, self-learning uh, uh, AI systems to improve that. So maybe one day there's going to be unmanned autonomous dredging, but we'll need AI and 5G to, to, uh, to get there. And, uh, uh, you know, it, that might completely change the way operations are run in this way. Second is lowering the risks uh, of, uh, you know, all kinds of risks that are uh, looking, uh, that we're facing. Um, I'm going to skip a couple here, but... Uh, Let's go immediately to some that are really important. For instance, this one. Uh, it might look far-fetched, but uh, take a look at, at this uh, video um, from Apple. The iPhone is the result of years of innovation. But true innovation means considering what happens to a product at every stage of its life cycle. Meet Liam. When it's time, Liam deconstructs your iPhone. Bum, 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 bum. Parts are detected bum, bum, bum. and removed and separated. So the materials inside those parts bum, bum, bum. can be repurposed. Okay, I'm not going to let it run completely. The point here is that Apple starts to take back a lot of their uh, old phones. Maybe you've had it. You get 100, 200 euro for your old phone. If it's a Samsung, they will take it back as well. But you don't get uh, any money. But the point is, is that they're building a closed loop economy. They're starting to go after the copper and the aluminum and the gold in their devices because it becomes feasible with AI and advanced robotics to disassemble those things at reasonable cost, and it becomes more interesting even than go for virgin material that's being mined in dodgy uh, situations. So this, combined with uh, the enhanced logistics and warehousing, creates a situation in which we have reshoring, like Adidas. Adidas is starting to build shoes in Germany again, Com completely done, uh, produced with robots, except for the how do you call it? Veters, laces, thank you. Apparently, robots cannot lace a shoe well, but they'll, they'll learn, they'll learn. It's like a, 
a teenager, they'll learn to do their uh, laces. Um, and so we're having this reshoring in which big uh, 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 companies, like Apple, for instance, start to make one of the Macintosh desktop computers back in the United States, and which could completely change the, the logistics uh, landscape uh, like we know it. This is uh, actually, uh, there's a TED talk about this by a guy from Boston Consulting, uh, who is really interesting. It's uh, 15 minutes, I think, it's worthwhile listening, and he explains how all these things that come together, AI, robotics, uh, he doesn't talk about closed loop yet, but you just have to think it uh, with it, uh, could completely and drastically change the way we look at uh, um, our uh, supply chains. And um, this is happening, let's see, I'm going to... Yeah, this is happening whether we like it or not. And, and uh, this could be what we call an iPhone moment. I always say Kodak moment because Kodak used to be the inventor of the digital camera. I don't know if you know that, but they, had to, they actually had the patents for the first digital camera in, in 1972 even, or 75. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, they went bankrupt because they failed to see the opportunity, the potential of this innovation. So they went bankrupt, uh, analog... Uh, uh, photography completely disappeared, but what's happening now is, in fact, that digital photography is completely disappearing. Since the introduction of the iPhone um, in 2007, the sale, and it's a bad slide, I'm sorry, but the sale of digital cameras has just dramatically gone wrong. So these changes can pose a real risk. If you're not ready for changes like that, if you don't have your eyes open for changes that are happening, or for regulation that's arriving, eh? like the IMO, who actually set a quite uh, ambitious target uh, of 50% reduction of greenhouse gas by 2050, knowing that the lifespan of a ship is 25 or 30 years. So it, it really means you only have a couple of years to start building ships and vessels that will be compliant with this regulation, who will probably be uh, uh, made more stringent. Norway, uh, in 2026, will ban all fossil fuel port vessels in their fjords. It's not a big deal. It's uh, 100 or 200 touristic vessels, but still, they will need to find a, a, a solution to, uh, to do it. And they actually do the same, Norway is incredible on, on that level, they actually do the same for aviation. By 2040, short haul coming to and departing from Norway will need to be uh, electric. And that's a plane that will be introduced next week in Paris that carries nine people, uh, has a, a 450 km per hour speed and an autonomy of a thousand kilometers and is fully electric. So also those solutions are there. I'm really running behind in time, but that's okay. Uh, no, it's not okay. I'm gonna scale up uh, or speed up, but uh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Never say that to me <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> okay, this is the most interesting part, and we'll be able to talk about it in, in the in the workshop. But there's new business opportunities uh, that arise. Obviously, many of you are working in these fields uh, already, so I, I don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel here. But in terms of climate change mitigation, obviously, we're, what you saw in this, the Finnish study uh, of Lut University, you guys are probably helping build this. Huh? The, 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 the thing that started as an experiment 15 years ago, a couple of wind turbines here on the North Sea, is now a big, thriving uh, business, and, and many of your firms are actually contributing to it. It's, it's, a, it's a beauty to see what's, what's happening and what's, what's changing, and, and the inventions that happen uh, as, as we go along. But it's interesting to, to remember that, uh, uh, you know, this could actually be a substantial part of our energy supply here in Europe. Uh, th theoretically, if you have 400 uh, kilometer by square, it's a large surface area, even with older turbines, 55 megawatts, we could uh, power uh, Europe for large part with that. It hinges on the infrastructure, of course, which also needs to be built, like uh, the super grid, uh, the energy union vision, in which it's much easier to all 
move to renewables if all the countries work together, which is a bit a metaphor for, for you guys, you know, who are here as competitors on the one hand, but also facing all of these changes and, and, and uh, threats from, uh, from China and other regions. It's easier to deal with this transition when you work together. It's the same thing for the, the, the energy transition. When you look at every single line separately would be a separate region, huh? there on the top right. If you combine them and you look at supply and demand, it's much easier to follow uh, the normal uh, monthly, but also daily uh, demand cycles for uh, electricity. So it's possible and it works better when we do it uh, together. And it drives incredible cost reductions. Those are exponential improvements as we see the new tenders eh, from, from Borsele to Krieger's flag and probably even new ones still in which we see this level uh, of uh, a cost uh, dramatically uh, dropping. It's, um, it's happening at an incredible speed, the turbines become larger, installed base becomes larger, etc. So it's a really exciting uh, development, I think. It's also starting to happen underwater. Um, much harder in terms of maintenance, much more tricky, much more permanent probably in terms of uh, uh, energy supply. So a couple of your companies probably also are, are looking at that. And then it's the hidden, the other side of the medal, is to do this energy transition, we'll need all kinds of new resources. We'll need batteries and, and nickel and neodymium and all of that to, uh, to uh, provide that. And that's where new developments like deep sea mining, which are tricky because, you know, will we mess up uh, a new unknown ecosystem or not? This and urban mining become to start really interesting approaches to look at how will we get to those rare earth rare earth uh, materials that we need to drive this uh, energy transition. Where can we find them? And maybe we can actually find them in uh, uh, what is called um, here, the urban mining. Uh, we, we just look at the waste around us and start to uh, integrate that as a source. Um, so that's the mitigation challenges, uh, projects in, in which many of you are probably uh, 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 working for right now, but on the other hand, we start. We need to start preparing for the change that's coming anyway. And we need to. When I show the three risks: losing all coastal cities, losing ecosystems, and then um, what was the the third? Yes, exactly. Tropical uh, regions. Um, the, the, the middle one uh, with the ecosystem services is a really underestimated one because this natural capital is not something we can just substitute. Uh, and so we see all kinds of initiatives in which um, we start to, to rebuild this natural capital in a way that not only protects us but that creates co benefits. Uh, uh, this is a uh, cake down, I think, the Zand Motor. I, I, I go uh, kite surfing there once in a while. It's, it's a, a recreational area, but it's also a form of coastal uh, protection. Uh, and this, this idea of, of building with and for nature uh, becomes very uh, pervasive and, and, and really interesting. So often it, it looks like, oh yeah, it's nice, you know, uh, we, have to, we have to do this. But a, an interesting thing is, is looking at how this is being financed. And I saw this example in a, in a conference uh, uh, last year, Climate Kick conference, in which one of the speakers said that insurers start to pay for this uh, restoration effort. They start to pay for, in this case, restoring barrier reefs, because obviously the, the property value of some resort, uh, 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 coastal resorts, is extremely high. And as we see those changes happening, they think it's worthwhile to work uh, and, and start restoring the natural barriers, recreating this, uh, 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 those uh, ecosystems. And this is something uh, that we see happening Everywhere, there's a lot of uh, thinking about how uh, we can, you know, reverse the damage that's been done. 
and look at the benefits that, that flow from that by creating a uh, substrate for, for uh, uh, you know, accelerating the, the, the reef uh, growth, uh, by also looking at uh, uh, ways to you know, create uh, natural protection, like a, a, a plan that's been uh, on the table for a long time here on, on, on the coast in, in, uh, in Belgium, the North Sea coast. Flemish Bay restoring and, and creating uh, you know, uh, islands to protect for, for the effects of, of sea level rise, but also creating a combination in which breakwaters are not only just a hard barrier, but also create uh, a habitat in which species can nest and spawn, but also in which people can enjoy some uh, uh, touristic uh, activities. So where you have a combination of, of uh, several uh, parts. And in the case of uh, uh, near Long Island, where they, uh, they did it, they simulated what would happen with uh, the during Storm Sandy without the intervention of those living breakwaters. And then what would have happened if they were to rebuild the shore with this living breakwater ID in which they connect ecosystems with coastal protection. And you see that the, the, the height reduction and in, in the impact of the waves is quite uh, significant, the way they uh, achieve this. There's, a, again, when you we get the PDF, you'll, you'll see that there's actually a, a, a great way to... Oh, man. To combine the benefits of different interventions and look at it from a systemic point of view. You're not just building one thing, you're also creating a series of uh, co-benefits. Okay, almost done. Last one is when you reduce your costs, you anticipate changes and you start to think about what risks your company uh, is running. When you look at the new needs that arise in terms of climate change mitigation and adaptation and you see how this creates uh, business opportunities for you, it's worthwhile talking about it so that you inspire others, inspire your customers and uh, you know, uh, help change for, uh, for the better. And um, I'm going to only give one example here. And Rene, I propose that I uh, close here and then explain the introduction for the workshop afterwards. OK, I have then, because I run uh, over time too much. Uh, um, I have four more slides and afterwards. This is Budweiser. You know Budweiser. It's one of the uh, you know, uh, most sold beers in the world. And they, they did a thing that's really <laughs> inspiring in terms of brand because it's so simple. They are moving to 100% renewable uh, energy for the production, for the brewing of their beer. And they just indicate it on their bottles. So you can see a bottle or a can uh, brewed with 100% uh, renewable. It's not a big deal. They don't have a big... Uh, uh, you know, uh, environmental reports to try to explain it. They just, this is, what you see is what you get. And there's a nice little uh, video that they made to... Uh, to It's essentially the choice that we're facing. What kind of future do we want? Do we want a future in which we're still investing in the past and in which we risk facing something that's actually quite scary? Eh? When we look at uh, the targets that we, are, uh, you know, that we want to respect by the end of the century, we see that we're hurling towards them at an incredible space, uh, speed. So this is the situation we're in. And the choice is simple. Do we want to build more and stay in the past, or do we want to move off of fossil fuels, use all the tools and the digital 
uh, help uh, that we can get to reinvent our economy, our society, and create economic opportunities. And that's what we invite you to think about today, later in the workshops, listening to the next speakers, and hopefully you'll be inspired and you will be the agents of change within your company. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank mm -hmm. you.